Okay. I see five seconds, but I'm still chasing the stream delay. My name is, uh, this is Pirate Miles, coming to you live from Brisbane, Australia. We are live and I'm here with three members of the European Pirate Parliament. Thank you so much for joining me, guys. So before we uh, jump into anything, I'm going to do what's called a, a welcome to country. Uh, here in Australia, we like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we gather. Obviously, us being online, we're not gathered together. However, I myself am broadcasting from Yagara and Turbal land, the country they call Mianjin, which today is on the east coast of Australia. This was uh, land where they never ceded sovereignty, and it was taken from them by what effectively amounts to an invasion through the colonial process. Now, we've, um, we've got an absolutely action-packed program ahead of us today, and super excited to have you all here with me. Why don't we go around and introduce ourselves? So for those of you who don't know me, and I hope most of you know me by now, I'm Pirate Miles. I am the president of Pirate Party Australia, have been for the last couple of years, and a candidate for the Senate, the upper house here in Australia. I understand we've got a lot of Europeans tuning in, getting up at the god awful time of 6 a.m. Central European time, or Americans hopping on at midnight or half past midnight to join us. Congratulations, thank you so much and welcome. I'm sorry about the time zones. I can't control physics. So let's jump in and uh, we'll introduce our three interviewees now. Can I get, um, Marcel, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, so thanks for uh, inviting me. Um, it's, it's an honor uh, for me. My name is Marcel Kolaya. I'm a member of the Czech Pirate Party and I'm a vice president of the European Parliament. Uh, and head of the delegation of the European Pirates in in, in the European Parliament. I am uh, an IT specialist by training, so no wonder that uh, I focus on digital policies in the European Parliament. Uh, we're packed by these policies uh, or policy initiatives in the European Parliament, the Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act, the European Democracy Action Plan, and that also brings me to my also uh, second field uh, of my focus, which is media independence and media freedom. There is some problem with microphone. I can't hear you. Oh, sorry, we're back. Um, thank you so much for that, Marcel. And uh, media independence is a huge issue in Australia at the moment, a real issue on everyone's lips. And that's something we're going to talk about, we're going to get into. But um, that's for later in the program. First, Nicholas, would you like to say a few words to introduce yourself? Uh, hello, everybody, and uh, th thanks very much for uh, inviting me. Uh, my name is Mikolaj Pekza. Uh, yeah, I studied biophysics. I did my PhD uh, in the field of uh, porous materials. Uh, I studied originally in both Czechia and Germany, so that's uh, where I came to the, uh, to the pirate movement. And uh, yeah, uh, I was elected in 2017 to the Czech parliament, later on in 2019 to the European parliament. Uh, where I'm mostly like interested in topics of uh, industry, uh, research, energy, uh, like digital finances, budgetary control, and uh, such uh, do, do those economic issues, so to say. Very cool. And um, energy policy is also a huge issue today here in Australia, particularly with renewable energy the transfer over to renewable energy here in Queensland went on as a sunshine state because of how much potential we have for solar power, potential which our government is failing to properly exploit, which is a failure economically and also a failure environmentally. But we'll get into that later. Next, we're going to get our third and final interviewee to introduce themselves. Patrick, would you like to say a few words, please? Hi, and greetings to Down Under. Uh, my name is Patrick Breyer, and um, I am a member of the German Pirate Party. I studied law and I um, passionately defend uh, human rights in, in the age of the digital revolution. I've been active in the German civil liberties movement for many years. And uh, also I've taken governments to court over several um, surveillance uh, laws, such as on data retention. 
And at the moment, I'm suing the commission over refusal of, of access to documents uh, regarding a very dubious project called iBorder Control, where they claim to be able to evaluate microfacial expressions on video to tell whether you're telling lies or not. Uh, it's, it's voodoo magic. Uh, I've been to Australia before, and uh, I actually spent a year and more in, in New Zealand, so I'm very glad to, to join you today. Awesome. Yeah. Um, telling people lying by facial expressions, it sounds like, uh, <laughs> like you say, view to magic, like the old, um, what do they call them? The lie detectors from the 1900s. It's um, scary stuff, but good on you for taking the um, governments to court. And uh, we all try to find how we can in different ways. And no one in Australia yet has sued the government on behalf of the Pirate Party, but we're not afraid to call them out on their bullshit. So <laughs> maybe one day someone with a law degree will do it officially. So thank you so much. And uh, my, my apologies in advance if I mispronounce any of your names. I am, I only, I, I obviously am an English speaker primarily, but I, I think I've been pretty good so far. And um, you guys, your English is all absolutely fantastic. So uh, congratulations on that. Let's, um, let's jump into some, some current affairs now to start off with. So there's been a, a huge issue on everyone's lips, something which everyone is talking about, everyone is scanning the news for, and most people, many people, myself included, when we first, uh, when this first came across our desk, we're like, what, what the hell is this? What's going on? I'm of course talking about Robin Hood and the short squeeze happening on GameStop stocks in the US traded on the NASDAQ. About um, two or three hours of pouring over Investopedia articles. <clears throat> I am proud to call myself a uh, economically literate, and I like to think I've got a little bit of a handle on the situation enough to <clears throat> jump in and, and, and buy some stock myself. So I bought into GameStop. I'm not ashamed to admit that, and um, pretty excited to see where this will go. So a little bit of background here for those who, who aren't quite sure with what the heck is going on. They, um, over in the, the US, hedge funds have been doing what's called short selling a certain stock where they're essentially making a bet that the stock is going to fail. And um, here in Australia, the, the company is, of course, known as EB Games, which is a pretty well-known site in all of our major cities along the eastern coast and urban centers. EB Games is where everyone has gone for 20 years to get your PC games, your console games, and so on. Uh, the good old brick and mortar stores, this is a, a company which accompanied my generation, certainly, as we were growing up all the way through. And over in America, the parent company GameStop, however, is struggling in the age of the internet. So people notice this, investors and hedge funds notice this and made a bet their stock is crashing and they're going to falter. However, Reddit investors have a different idea and decided that, hang on a second, these guys are betting that the stock is going to fall. They're literally betting that this company is going to fail, that tens of thousands of jobs in the US are going to be lost, tens of thousands of jobs here in Australia is going to be lost and a cultural icon of our generation is going to disappear. I shudder to call EB Games a cultural icon, I apologize. But that's where we're at. We are the internet generation. And so the internet took off to jump in and buy stocks of GameStop. And now what's happened is trading has been shut down on many platforms. The NASDAQ is talking about doing a trading halt on GameStop. The um, Robin Hood, the trading app, which built itself as uh, democratized trading for everyone as a way to help retail investors get in the game, it's shut down trading there as well. It's also forcefully placing sell orders for people who have bought stock. They are deliberately forcing in, uh, retail investors like myself to take a loss on stock they've bought in order to prevent these massive hedge funds from taking a loss because they bet that the stock would fall, but the stock has not fallen. It has gone from $7 about 12 months ago, $7 a share, to peaking at $512 a share about 16 hours ago during... Um, off trading hours. That's an incredible meteoric rise. And a lot of people are predicting that the GameStop shares are going to go even higher, theoretically into the thousands. So what we've got is, and now US, um, US elected US members are actually caught getting involved in this. So in a stunning twist of events that is already crazy than anything 2020 could provide, not, in, uh, not only has Ted Cruz jumped in to call out hedge funds in this, but also Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez of the well-known Democratic squad has also jumped in to team up, perhaps, possibly, in looking at regulating these hedge funds. Now, this is, an, this is a developing situation, and it's absolutely wild what's going on. So I want to, I want to hear some, some takes now from what you guys in Europe are doing about this. 
Now, uh, Mikolas, I know you've done some work in, in digital finances and promoting the concept of a digital euro and modernizing financial services in Europe. What's your take on this? Well, uh, I first have to uh, admit that I was really like sad that uh, at that point that I'm actually a member of parliament because I've realized that it's not feasible for a member of parliament to really like go on uh, go on the stock exchange and uh, oh, buy some. No. Sort of, I was really oh. like uh, thinking I, w I would go for that as well, but like at that point I didn't. So I'm kind of like uh, I, I can frame my neutrality on that issue because I'm absolutely not economically interested in this uh, in this case. But what I have to admit, and what is what is my general like impression from like working in the let's say financial part of the parliament, is we are or our society as it is currently now is very much focusing on this like uh, big companies like all the financial sector of it, it is centralized. You speak with giants like in, uh, in Europe it's Deutsche Bank or Commerzbank, but uh, in uh, they are they are everywhere and. You see it uh, with the hedge funds. Most of the uh, most of the time, like the parliamentarians, the politicians, they are very much interested in in talking them. I mean, like what happens in practice is that those companies are always like in uh, close contact with with uh, elected politicians, uh, expressing their opinions and in, uh, even like trying to influence that. So as a result, under normal circumstances, they are very much staying for like the regulation of, of those respective funds, effectively kind of like providing them maximum playing field they even could have uh, on the, let's say, cost of some sort of, I would say, consumer protection. Like if you are a, a small common person, you really cannot like uh, get those advantages uh, that the system provides you. At this point, I, I was kind of like nicely surprised about the fact that the common people, common people uh, who are really like uh, supportive to this company, who who are like enjoying the brand that was the, really like a sister cultural symbol, they team together and really like acted uh, in their own interest and uh, worked together and kind of like over, uh, overruled this this traditional uh, traditional system. For me, this was really really like. Uh, impressive and nice uh, sign of, let's say, in, in, I would, what I would call normality. So yeah, now we will have a quite like interesting a discussion about like regulating, but I'm not, uh, I don't think that uh, we are here to, let's say, regulate the, the, the small users and uh, of the financial system and kind of like restrict them. I mean, th that's, that's what happened now and what was highlighted in this case is quite common in the uh, world of finances. The, the big players they are using their power in order to uh, in order to uh, enrich themselves on the costs of the smaller one this this case was quite like shiny but we should keep it in mind and uh, keep it for the discussion we will have about the regulation of financial sector because the small reddit users who team themselves for a good thing are not those who should be punished because of this case yeah absolutely Look, regulation is always going to be a word on everyone's lips. And for us pirates who, who always tend to lean into the left libertarian basket, you know, we're always going to have, have that thought, is, is the regulation here justified? Is it regulation that we need? Is it something that, will, that could potentially cause more harm than good? And in the past, we've absolutely seen some crazy examples where regulation of the stock market in the US has, <laughs> has, has been a, a paper blanket, a wet, wet blanket in front of a bull you know, a paper wall in front of a bull. And in other cases, we've seen important regulation repealed entirely to try and promote market uh, market development with predictably disastrous con consequences like the 2008 GFC, which hit worldwide here in Australia. We all suffered because of rich hedge funds in the US just um, <laughs> playing with everyone's livelihood, just having a nice gamble there. So uh, uh, does anyone else want to want to jump in here? Patrick or Marcel, what, what's your take on this? Yeah, so 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 to be honest, um, um, the the way how we work in the European Parliament is basically that we split topics in um, uh, in a way that that uh, because you really need to understand very um, to the very nitty gritty of what's happening, and this is um, very clear Mikulash's agenda. Uh, so I don't really follow closely and uh, I don't think I can say anything to add uh, to, to what Mikulash already said. 
Interesting, cool. Well, that um, that actually brings us on to uh, another discussion topic, which which uh, I've completely completely slipped my mind, but it's actually a pretty important one. We should probably get into. And I'm um, talking about here, uh, w what the hell is the European Parliament? Now, um, we're obviously, most of our most audience here is Australian. We've got a fair idea of what how the Australian government works. Basically, it doesn't. It's full of idiots that should be thrown in jail. But over in the EU, you don't just have local governments or state governments or country level governments. You've also got a European wide government. So, uh, uh, Marcel, do you want to take that a little bit further and just sort of quickly explain how the European Parliament actually works and what it's for? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so in a sense, actually, we don't have a European government per se, uh, but the, uh, the the European Union, uh, you know, works in a way that there are three main institutions. Um, uh, one is the European Parliament, that is the a legislative body that were representative of citizens uh, of Europe, of the European Union are elected. So we have, th this body has 705 uh, representative um, uh, of, of the citizens of the European Union. And uh, uh, to uh, the, the, the role of the European Parliament is complemented by the European Commission uh, and by the Council. Um, the, the Council consists of representatives of individual member states, so, so that's a different, let's say, concept of representation. And uh, the, the European Council, uh, sorry, uh, the, the European Commission is the, is the body that, you know, you would, uh, clo that would be closest uh, in an understanding to, uh, to a government. Uh, however, it, it does not really have such a role um, uh, completely because the competences are um, divided between the individual, uh, let's say, uh, the member state uh, per se, uh, and the, the, the European Commission or the European uh, uh, Union. So you can imagine that as, you know, you have areas like, for instance, healthcare or education, where the primary role of responsibility lies on the member state. Uh, but then you have other areas, um, and my favorite in, in that example is, for instance, uh, internet regulation policies, which clearly lie uh, in the scope of the European Union because the internet is global and we don't want uh, fragmentation of the internet. Um, uh, well, honestly, from my pirate perspective, we don't want the fragmentation worldwide, but, but we don't, uh, of course, want the fragmentation on individual uh, you know, member states that would be even even worse. But uh, the the thing is, that the principle is that there's this principle of, of subsidiarity, which means things that can be solved on a lower level are solved on the lower level. Things that are uh, better to solve together, like for instance, the internal market of the European Union, they are solved on the level of the Union. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, sub subsidiarity, that's a really interesting word and obviously comes from to subside for things to settle to the bottom. That um, makes perfect sense, although I've never heard that word used in that context before. <laughs> so cool. Yeah, um, and, and in, in context of regulation, I absolutely agree that some things, the internet being global, for example, need to be regulated from a relatively central perspective and that, um, and that we need to have that that top level arcing arcing down and we've we've had a few here in australia we've had a few people call the pirates out for being um the old good old new world order globalists for, for supporting centralized regulation you know the, the you know the old conspiracy theory but and uh, and you know all you have to do is look at our policies and see very clearly that i know we in australia we support decentralization to a huge degree we support grassroots democracy we support direct democracy and access to decision making power for everyone through the power of digital technologies, and that's that's in every way we operate, and and so we only go to that central regulation where it makes sense and where it is necessary, such as for internet regulation. <clears throat> so, let's um, let's let's roll on to the 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 next sort of big topic. So, in in on on the subject of of central regulation and economic regulation, another big issue which is going on at the moment, which a lot of people are talking about, is 
what um, it, it, it's things are still a bit up in the air at the moment. A lot of people in Australia are asking questions, but the the question that everyone is asking is or has asked is why is Google threatening to leave Australia? And this is um, this is something which we in the Pirates have very strong feelings about here in here at the Australian Pirate Party, and we've done a lot of talking about it and a lot of arguing about it, and we've interestingly copped a bit of flack from all sides for this for our stances. Now we put out two press releases so far. And all of the first one was we were commenting on a fairly obscure um, government inquiry. Uh, and we're just like, hey, hang on a second. There's some problems here. Not many people are interested in that. But as soon as the, the bill actually comes out and it's being voted in government right now, uh, not as we speak, but uh, in, in, in coming days or weeks, suddenly people are like, oh, hang on a second. Hang on a second. Whoa, whoa, whoa hang on a second. And so now we've got, um, we've got people on the left and on the right calling us out for, uh, for our, the position we've taken. What... First, though, let's zoom out a little bit and, and figure out what, what the hell is going on with this Google and Facebook tax, as we're calling it. So the, there's a little bit of history here, which I'll briefly cover. It dates back to about 2017. So for those of you at home who aren't clued in on Australian politics, we have a, a, a neoconservative government at the moment who, in all their wisdom, support, quote unquote, free market policies to um, trickle down economics, jobs, something like that. I, I don't think they're really sure. But um, about 2017, there was uh, some some whinging and whining from a certain uh, a certain company called News Corp, News Corporation, who are quite infamous here in Australia, but also a little bit infamous over in the UK, as I understand, for their News of the World publication there. Now, um, the, the the whinging from this this organisation was that well, we're not making quite as many billions as we'd like to, so we'd like to tax a company which is making many billions, we'd like to have some of that money, please. So the government initiated an inquiry. Several recommendations came out of it. One of these recommendations was stricter privacy controls for greater consumer protection and to encourage consumer trust in digital platforms. One of the recommendations of the ACCC digital platforms inquiry, you can find it online. Uh, we in the Pirates obviously support that. Unfortunately, one of the other recommendations, which came directly, which is directly copied from submissions by uh, for-profit corporations such as a News Corp and, and so on, was that, well, we're not making much money and we're concerned that online platforms like Google and Facebook are making loads of money from ads and they're also sharing our news articles at the same time. So we'd like some of that money, please. We'd like a share of that money. So the government has taken that and ran with it. And so essentially the proposal that we're left with is that um, this law specifically targets Google and Facebook only Google and Facebook. So that's right off the bat, there's a problem there when you have to legislate specifically to target specific companies. And, and the legislation says, uh, if I can really very crudely briefly summarize, the leg legislation says, well, you have, to, uh, you have to go and negotiate with these news companies in, in order to uh, come to some kind of commercial arrangement for linking to their news articles. So, so the implication there is that Google should be paying uh, seven news for linking to seven news articles that Google should be paying uh, the Guardian or the ABC for linking to uh, Guardian or ABC news articles. And if if Google says, well, look, we're not quite sure this is economically feasible for us, that we're, uh, you know, paying you to give you referral traffic, then the news company can go to the government and say, well, look, they're refusing to pay us money. So we need to go to arbitration. Then an, then an arbitration panel can, uh, can um, make a decision. They'll hear submissions from Google or, or Facebook, and they'll hear submissions from uh, News Corp, Guardian, ABC, SBS, so on and so forth, about how much whoever should be paying and who it should be paid to, and then they'll make a decision about how much Google or Facebook should be paying to this news organization. So, so suddenly we've opened up this massive can of worms where, um, and, uh, where we've got so many different issues pinging off in so many different directions that everyone is going like, well, what, what the hell is going on? But the, the reality is, our take on it is that it's bad. Multiple reasons why it's bad, and we've, we've said so. And um, to, to briefly highlight some of the key issues there. So we in the Pirates, for those of you who aren't familiar, we care a little bit about internet piracy and copyright reform. It's something we do consider fairly important. So we, we talk about something called fair use which is the idea that uh, you, can, you can make use of a bit of content without actually being forced to pay for it. And usually it's just fair use exemption will typically only cover an article headline or an article excerpt or summary or so forth. 
what Google is doing by, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm ranting and preaching a little bit here, but this is something I care very deeply about. What Google is doing by link index, search indexing an article title, I believe it falls under fair use. You may disagree, and we'll get into that in a second. Uh, listeners at home may disagree, but I believe it falls under fair use. And so why, why are we suddenly expanding our copyright regime in, and calling it something completely different, a stealth tax, when all they're doing is essentially making fair use and they're sending potentially hundreds of millions of dollars in referral value. And, and so to compound this issue, moving on further, suddenly it's not the government which is making, enforcing this regular, well, it's not the government which is making these decisions about what to pay. Now we've got an independent arbitrator panel. And, and I know this is something which has actually come up in the, um, in, in, in the EU. I believe it was, um, I think it was Nicholas. This was something which, which you've actually campaigned around, campaigned around with the um, uh, external arbitration panels making decisions when they should be democratically decided by a government. So suddenly we've got 20 different rules for 20 different companies and this privately enforced, publicly enforced private tax of money transfer between co corporations. So uh, we're going to get into some questions now. Sorry for sorry for that. That kind of went for a little bit, but I just wanted to give a little background there for our Australian viewers because this is obviously a developing situation, but also for our European viewers who are tuning in. Now, I, I might have mentioned here or there in our press releases that um, this is very similar to something that happened in Europe a few years ago, which which uh, our, our friends in the European part movement were calling the link tax, where uh, where where copyright draconians were essentially saying, well, we want to charge every time you link to a bit of content. And I understand the, the Pirate Party, the European Pirate Party did a bit of activism about this. Um, Patrick, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, definitely. We've been campaigning on this for a long time because it was actually Germany that first came up with the bad idea to introduce such a link tax, which later failed in court. But still, German politicians such as Axel Voss uh, made it EU law, and that's where uh, we stand now. But actually, the experience was really a failed one because um, uh, when when Google News uh, threatened to delist uh, um, major uh, uh, news sites who who insisted on 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 revenue, then they basically in the end uh, found an agreement to. Um, to, to be listed uh, without any remuneration, just to, to stay on Google News, because obviously it's in the interest of the publishers as well. And um, they make money from those referrals uh, um, through the advertisements. And so um, in the end, it doesn't make sense at all to be paying for it. And anyway, journalists have certainly never seen any additional remuneration from this. Uh, it's, it's the rights holders that I'd hope to, um, to, to make a penny of it. Uh, the risk to, to internet users really is that um, under EU legislation, I don't know about Australia, um, this right does not only apply to, to, to Google and, and commercial um, uh, enterprises, but actually to anyone. And so you can no longer use uh, a long excerpts uh, for linking um, a content, which is a huge problem because it really limits uh, freedom of expression and also access to information. And um, I'm afraid it also boosts fake news because if it's more difficult to, to find quality news um, because um, you know they, they won't link to it because they, they would have to pay for it. If it's more difficult to find quality news, then uh, they will list and people will read uh, uh, stuff on, on Facebook um, and um, unreliable uh, um, fake news and, and so-called alternative news, uh, which is exactly what we want to avoid. Also, it's a, a business problem because um, it discourages startups that want to uh, um, you know, enable access to news. And also it's a disadvantage for small publishers that really rely on, on, on aggregator sites like Google News to um, for people to, to get known to them, for people to be able to access their news. So maybe the, the major uh, publishers and broadcasters can do uh, without it, but the small ones are really um, rely, ra rely on being made more accessible um, in this way. And so it really damages uh, uh, competition. And finally, um, when it comes to, to the legal discussion, uh, it's very questionable if, if this link tax is actually compliant with the Berne Convention. 
which is an international treaty on copyright and that guarantees a right to quote news articles and also to create pr press summaries expressly. And uh, I don't think it's, it's even in line uh, with that. So it's really a, a piece of, of failed legislation that interferes with, um, with internet rights. And um, I hope that the, the publishers uh, will discover sooner rather than later that this doesn't make sense at all and that it's not the right way to, to tackle the fundamental and, and underlying problems. Actually, what's being discussed in Europe right now is to ban personalized advertising. And I think that would go uh, much further to, to help the, uh, the publishers, but we should discuss this separately. Yeah, if, I, if I may add uh, to it, uh, maybe from a bit overarching perspective, you know, Oh, we seem to have uh, dropped out. Centralization, which really is not good. And, um, you know, the legislators are trying to resolve this issue by a very, you know, bad, non-systematic, uh, by a very bad non-systematic approach. So they think about, you know, how to deal with this issue of, you know, Google basically having a monopoly, a Facebook as well on their segments of market by introducing an obligation to pay, you know, to the media that are uh, financially suffering. Um, and but this is not going to resolve resolve the issue. I think we need to, you know, get back to the fundamentals of the internet, which is decentralization, and we need to tackle the problem from a completely different uh, perspective. Um, uh, we need to, you know, look at how we can decentralize the internet back, which is um, uh, one of the legislation that that uh, I've been working on uh, called the Digital Markets Act that, that tries to tackle this um, with this principle of interoperability that, uh, that large dominant platforms would have the obligation to allow for interoperability from other players on the market. So then, then you know, if we speak, for instance, about social networks, Facebook would have to provide an API and documentation uh, and, and what's needed in order that, you know, uh, social networks like, for instance, uh, Mastodon, which is a de decentralized social network, you know, could interconnect with it and you could stay in touch with your friends that are on Facebook while not necessarily needing an account on Facebook, not, not needing to have an account on, on Facebook. By that, we would allow competition to grow because that's one of the biggest issues today. People are not necessarily on these large platforms because they are the best, because they protect their privacy. No, they are there usually because they have their friends there and it's very difficult to, uh, to, to change the platform that you want to be on because there's no one there yet. But while people are not joining there for this reason, no, no one will be there. So, so, so we need to tackle this chicken and egg problem. Uh, so, so that that's one of the things uh, I wanted to say. And the second thing I want to uh, I wanted to say is, you know, uh, Google threatened that they would leave the Australian market if if this bill uh, passes. And well, that's not really far fetched. I need to say because this is what happened in Spain in the past when a similar provision. Uh, was adopted that just Google News left the the, the Spanish market. So so I don't I, I don't think it's it's really you know far fetched, and uh, I think that you're doing a great job as the Australian Pirate Party to criticize this bill because it goes in a really really wrong direction and goes against the principle of the internet per se. Yeah, we're looking at the uh, walled garden ideology, the idea that um, we see most obviously in Apple where everything is kept within the Apple ecosystem. But we've also started to see with Google as of about 10, 15 years ago, where so much more Google services are very centralized. 
and again on, on Facebook, a lot of the Facebook stuff is very much, we want to keep things in Facebook. And, and you know, you hear Facebook and Google just recently saying, we provide huge amounts of referral value. You know, we, um, <clears throat> Google apparently years ago, someone said that, oh, we want to get people off our platform or to third party as soon as possible. <laughs> Well, no, there was, a, there was an analysis by themarkup.com, which I actually just read today, which found that um, on the average Google page, anywhere from 40 to 60% of the content from a Google search is going to be uh, Google uh, internal Google web pages or Google products. And, and sometimes that is going to include content, which Google has scraped from third-party websites. Now, uh, now, that's absolutely copyright infringement. And um, I'm, I'm a copyright minimalist. I believe in reform and fair use exemptions. And we've advocated that for, well, over a decade now as, as part of the pirate movement. But in this case, where Google is unfairly profiting off things, they should be, as a for-profit business, they should be paying tax, they should be pay, paying royalties on, on that content. But I believe for the majority of cases, that's not happening with Google searches. In the majority of cases, it's not happening with Facebook. So all we can... Uh, in terms of the news media bargaining code, I've got this very sneaky suspicion that it's going to go to arbitration and Facebook and Google are going to present their case and say, well, uh, well, you're on a, a dear arbitration panel. We, for this particular website, Seven News, we provide them with, uh, you know, $250 million, $100 million worth of referral traffic every year. Uh, so, so how much do you think we should pay them for the privilege of providing them that referral traffic? I think that's, I have a sneaky suspicion that's the way it's going to go down. And um, it's, it's, it's an absolute mess. And where the way we're, the way we're playing it is saying that, um, you know, it's a stealth tax for um, going directly to Murdoch media, to the mates of the liberal party here in Australia to, to pay for their donation campaigns because the original legislation didn't include ABC or the SBS. It did not include the public broadcasters. So for those of you at home who are listening and following along here in Australia, we have a much loved, um, we call her auntie, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. She's done some incredible things for Australia over the years, been there for um, many classic moments of Australian history and um, also been under constant attack from the Liberal National Party and Conservatives, perhaps because uh, good old auntie ABC speaks the truth, unbiased, and she shows what ordinary people are doing here in Australia. And conservatives don't like that. They don't like hearing a fair and unbiased media. So uh, much, much trouble abounds. But with a little bit of luck, we can um, keep pushing away. And maybe just like you and the EU had some wins on the link tax, maybe we'll have some wins on this code as well in, in the year or years to come. So um, uh, Marcel, you've got an interesting thought here. What's uh, what can we do to promote more media independence and counter consolidation? Because here in Australia, that's a huge issue. And that's something which a lot of people really care about that uh, News Corporation owned by uh, good old Master Murdoch has something like 60, 60 to 80% of the, of the media market here in Australia. That's an incredible amount of centralization, incredible amount of consolidation. Marcel would take it away. Yeah, I believe that uh, this is an issue uh, where not necessarily there's one solution that fits all. And um, I, I don't really understand the Australian uh, situation to the extent that I can uh, really comment it in, in detail and, you know, give you, um, uh, give you a solution uh, to the problem that you've been having um, on this market in Australia. Uh, but I can compare it to what's uh, happening what's been happening in um, uh, in Europe, where in in some of the countries, uh, especially in the Central and European, uh, in the Central and Eastern European region, uh, including the Czech Republic, actually, um, you know, there has been this uh, very bad trend of media independence going down. Uh, our I know that it might sound really, you know, ridiculous, uh, but our prime minister in the Czech Republic owns like one third of the market. 
I mean that that's that's just I mean yeah I know the first for someone that does not know the situation this might sound really ridiculous but but that's that's exactly what it is and um, um, the 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 market in the Czech Republic is not in in the worst shape in in Europe there are co countries that are doing actually worse uh, which is for instance Poland and Hungary. And there is this uh, press uh, media freedom index uh, that uh, that you know puts uh, countries on um, uh, on a ranking how they're doing um, when it comes to uh, press media, uh, press um, uh, press freedom, and um, uh, uh, you can see that the Czech Republic, Poland, and and, and Hungary are constantly you know falling on this ranking throughout the, the recent years. And you can also very easily link it uh, to an issue of, um, of uh, democracy basically being in, in, in jeopardy and with the issue of uh, rule of law which Mikuláš actually, you know, has one of his uh, uh, core agenda uh, when it comes to, uh, let's say, the financial uh, side of um, uh, of the rule of law and and how to enforce rule of law. Um, so maybe he could spare a couple of words on that. But I take it from the media side. So so you can see that there is a very, you know, close link with these and. Uh, from my perspective, and if I look at Poland and Hungary and the Czech Republic, what is the main, um, what one of the main, you know, attributes of you know seeing the uh, the media independence going down and media freedom going down and the situation on the market be be bad, if uh, that that happens exactly when uh, rule of law is not pr uh, respected. And it happens exactly when the public service media actually go down. So, for instance, the situation in Poland is that the the, the, the public broadcaster, uh, uh, the, the the main TV uh, called TVP, uh, basically uh, serves as a propaganda channel uh, for for the government party. Um, and uh, this is this is a really huge issue because then when you do not have in media the natural opposition and basically controlling the government, then of course it's very difficult for citizens to understand that maybe the government might be doing some things that are just not right. So uh, again, I cannot really say from the Australian perspective, but, but from the European one, for me what is really important is to keep a high standard for the public service media, uh, because without that, uh, without that, then the situation really goes south. And also, it's very important uh, to uh, to keep uh, the rule of law principle, so that politicians cannot really do whatever they want. Uh, the situation in the Czech Republic, where a high-profile politician, a a prime minister, the prime minister owns a large portion of the media market. Is exactly what what you know is the problem that is uh, causing that the situation is going south. Yeah, and I remember that. Um, uh, I think in Italy, Silvio Silvia Silvio Berlusconi also owned a huge chunk of the media. I believe former prime minister uh, before he went to jail. I don't know if he still owns it, but I know he went to jail. <laughs> Possibly connected. Who knows? Um, uh, uh, look, look, look uh, that, that's an that's an interesting um, uh, uh, anecdote here because um, yes, if I remember correctly, he went to jail. Uh, uh, you might not believe it, but he's a member of the European Parliament now. We call that failing upwards. <laughs> Australian politicians do it all the time. Uh, one minute they're a member for, you know, whoop, whoop. The next minute they're ambassador to the European Union or they're head of the banking alliance of West Australia. Thank you very much, former Queensland Premier Anna Bly. Now, let's, um, there's just a, been a comment in chat, which I would read out because it kind of hits me deep at the core. Lee Gerrity has said, I've been online before Google even hit the net and seeing how it's gone in the past 20 plus years is heartbreaking. The net was never designed to be what it has become now. Never teary face. I stand that sentiment because I am a former Google fanboy. 
uh, I, I used to love Google. They were the um, poster child of the, the wild noughties where everything was free and open on the internet. And, uh, you know, everyone supported open source and the pirate movement was just getting started. And we had rosy, rosy cheeks and stars in our eyes about the promise of decentralization and that free access to information would erode the barriers of the old and the corrupt. And turns out Google is no longer not evil. Take, re read into that however you like. Obviously, they changed their motto some time ago, don't be evil. The, um, the obvious co corollary is that Google thinks it's okay to be evil now. So for those of you who, um, those of you listening at home, please feel free to put comments or questions in chat. I'm more than happy to read them out and provide them to, uh, to, to our interviewees here. If you have a question for one of the three members of the European Parliament or for myself or anyone else, and I um, want to put it out there, we're taking questions on Twitter, Facebook and uh, Discord and pretty much any platform where we're monitoring, which is most of them, I hope. Soon to be possibly even TikTok or Instagram, I'm told, but I don't believe it. <laughs> so um, let, let's, uh, let's um, jump to a uh, question on Twitter, which came through. This question is for, uh, th this question I'm going to give to Patrick, actually, because it relates to, to Germany. And um, uh, Patrick, I noticed you've wanted to add something as well. So maybe you can s sort of take the floor for a little bit. The question is, could you please give an update on the upload filter issue as it relates to the EU and in particular Germany, as there seems to be some recent activity on it. Uh, Patrick, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, well, basically um, what I wanted to, to comment on the previous issue of, of um, media plurality is that we have the very same problem all over Europe as well. Uh, some governments are considering to tackle it by actually funding the media, but that's like a terrible solution because it makes them dependent on, on government funds and um, uh, we certainly don't want the, the free press to because um, their, their function really is to control the government and they can't do that reliably if they uh, receive funds uh, from them. And actually one of the governments that has been doing that is Hungary, which is known for um, its so-called illiberal democracy model um, that is followed by the leadership, by the authoritarian leadership. So uh, hands off that idea. Um, what I mentioned before as a possible solution is um, banning personalized advertising, because that is something that's um, uh, sucking advertising money away from traditional publishers. Because obviously with a newspaper or a TV station, you can't uh, uh, personalize your advertising. You can't uh, target people uh, using um, information about um, their uh, uh, privacy, about their sexual orientation, um, about their age, about um, their weaknesses. Uh, all of which are information that are um, mined uh, from internet users um, without asking them so far. And so um, we're pushing hard that in the context of uh, current reform, um, Digital Services Act, um, that uh, personalized um, advertising is, is banned. Uh, that would put uh, the traditional media on an equal uh, footing as the uh, internet media, so they can use context-based advertising. And um, actually, quite a few numbers show uh, that um, the ad revenue does not decrease in the way that um, it, it was uh, thought and, and feared. So um, talk about uh, um, upload filters. So there's this terrible uh, a policy um, from tech companies, including Google, um, to use these um, filters to um, automatically flag or often even automatically remove um, or not allow in the first place the upload of certain material. It's used against copyright material. It's used against terrorist content online. It's used against um, child sexual abuse uh, material but also against many content that only violate the terms and conditions and no law at all. Um, yes, such as strange um, US feelings about um, naked statutes, et cetera, uh, <laughs> they won't allow you to show. And- um, we, we know how much so the terrible need sex. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's really strange. Uh, so the terrible thing about these filters is that they're really um, error prone. Um, uh, so, um, they will, uh, where they use so-called artificial intelligence or machine learning to detect uh, content, they really suppress um, at a massive scale uh, illegal content. 
And even um, where they are on spot, for example, with, with copyrighted content, the filter can't tell whether you still have the right to use copyright content under fair use because you are uh, quoting uh, something, because you're criticizing something. You can have a right to use copyrighted content. And same with terrorist content. It really depends on the context um, that you're using a photo, for example. Are you using it because you're a terrorist organization or are you using it because you're a press outlet and reporting on a terrorist incident? And filters can't tell. So they will overblock and they will overblock massively. And that's why um, many European countries have protested and taken to the streets to protest the EU copyright reform that was nonetheless by a very small margin decided, um, adopted last year, just before the European elections. Um, the parties that were responsible to it suffered major losses in the elections uh, subsequently. And I think the European Parliament has learned a bit from that. So far, major parties are avoiding the, the topic, um, but we've managed to exclude it from new anti-terrorism legislation. So what happens to the copyright upload filters? They are in the process of transposing them in Germany into national law, um, but um, Poland has, has filed a, a court action um, against the EU copyright directive that requires to use these upload filters um, against copyrighted uh, content. And the European Court of Justice will have to decide, um, hopefully later this year, whether this is actually compliant with uh, freedom of expression. I'm a bit wary of that decision because the court has in the past ruled that um, uh, Facebook would have to um, uh, uh, block uh, diff defamatory speech, um, not only remove it, but also block it in the future. Some Austrian politician, actually from the Green Party, sued Facebook. And uh, the court unfortunately decided that they could actually uh, demand an order, a court order, uh, requiring Facebook to, to suppress um, uh, similar content posted in the future, which is a huge problem because again, this very same content that is maybe defamatory can be legal in a different context. For example, if I publish the court judgment which, which actually consults, uh, which actually contains the insults, but it is still legal to publish a court judgment. And so for some purposes or in a different context, it can be legal to use the very same words and using an upload filter on this suppresses legal and free speech. So that's why it's completely the wrong approach. Uh, we pirates are really a driving force behind uh, uh, pushing back against these um, error prone uh, uh, um, algorithms. Look, this issue is a little bit personal for me because um, here in Australia, we tried something, we, the government tried something very similar about uh, 12 years ago. It was called the clean feed. And um, this was the issue which really got me into politics the first time. This is the issue which really got me into the Pirate Party. And, and the only reason I tell this story all the time, but I'm going to tell it again, God damn it. The only reason I'm not a founding member of the Pirate Party in Australia was because I was too young to vote. So I couldn't legally be a member. And I'm still a little bit sore about that. But, but that it is. Is what it is i can't control the laws of time and and so the labor government at the time center left they call themselves <laughs> decided well we need some votes where are we going to get votes from oh i know everyone hates child porn and obviously it's a terrible thing but um but they're like well we need to crack down on it somehow we need to prove ourselves strong on child porn and so they they brought in this this filter for it and um at, at, they blocked the they blocked two as I recall, they blocked two legal porn websites for some reason. They blocked a euthanasia website and they blocked some, uh, from memory, radical I Islamic websites. <laughs> and that was about it. And obviously half of those websites had changed their name and IP within like, like in a month and you could get around them without even using a VPN. And this, this is a center left government at the time. So we, that was one of our, very early issues for the Australian pirates and for me got me involved in the Australian pirate movement. It was called No Clean Feed, hashtag No Clean Feed. That was our campaign back then. Uh, it lasted for, I think, 27 days before the, the Labour government realised, hey, this is shit. But obviously the Liberals supported it as well. They're like, well, it doesn't go far enough. We need to, we need to block um, uh, all, this, all this other crap at the time and they want to expand it basically. And, um, and so, once again, we, we find ourselves, so we, we always have and will continue to support free speech in Australia. And so once again, here with the news media bargaining code, we find ourselves aligned squarely against liberal and labor, the two mainstream parties here in Australia. 
and unfortunately also the Australian Greens who have supported the news media bargaining code. And although we often align with them on privacy and copyright issues, they've often had some sensible positions in the past, particularly with uh, now former Senator Scott Ludlam, who, who we have consistently respected, admired and supported. Unfortunately, he has gone and uh, we can only question the direction the Greens are going in since with their support of this new law. So interesting things abound, but, but we, we do find ourselves without allies at times for, for the stances we take here in Australia. But that's what it comes down to, taking a principled stance. Now, um, does- um, Yeah, if anyone... I may jump in, if yes, I may please. jump in. Yeah, I, I think it, it's, a, it's a good thing to do take a principal stance, uh, even though, you know, if you find yourself being alone. And I, I think that's the, that's the defining, um, you know, power of the pirate parties around the world, because why the pirate parties have been found, uh, founded in the first place, it's because that politicians of other political parties were just, you know, outdated. They were not fit for the digital age. And we definitely need more politicians that understand how the internet works. I, I, I have seen so many politicians where I, 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 I always had the feeling with them that they would actually be better with if the internet did not exist because the world was so, so, so easier uh, back in the days. Everything was, you know, um, uh, somewhere on the paper and uh, there was no easy way how to spread all these, you know, um, disinformation and illegal content and fake news and, and, and everything. But I mean, that's not how the pirate politicians see the future. We, we see a, um, uh, a society that is free and informed and educated and in digitally interconnected. So, so that I think is our major differentiator and that, well, yeah, it, it happens then that on some policies, we just don't find an ally because other parties are not there yet. That that's just how it is. And, uh, we need to understand that the internet is not some uh, completely different new world. It, it's, it, it is part of our world. It, it's one world always, always one world. And the problem I have, um, not only with upload filters, but in general with these policies of taking content you know, down and, and saying, yeah, okay, we resolved the issue. The problem is we haven't resolved the issue. Look at the child sexual abuse material. One thing is to take the illegal content down, but that's apparently not sufficient. We need to go after those who abuse children. And I don't really hear it from other politicians that this is the core issue that we need to go after those who actually create this material they basically are fine with taking the content down and the job is done and that that's that's not sufficient for me yeah yeah and, and when it comes to internet censorship like this there's four issues which kind of pop up from what i see seem to pop up again and again and um the the obvious the obvious censorship issue for us is with copyright where things like the upload filter try to get twisted towards uh, copyright enforcement and um, and and um, uh, same thing over here as well. Uh, another issue we've seen, obviously, giant porn um, restrictions there, but uh, another issue here in Australia, which we actually grappled with, one of the very early projects of the Pirate Party in Australia was to, on the issue of euthanasia, the clean feed in 2008-2009 attempted to block euthanasia websites because that was illegal at the time and still is that we're barely starting to reach a level where it's uh, accepted at a um, at a mainstream level. But back in 2008-2009, we held workshops in Sydney and in Melbourne, I believe, on how to use a VPN to get around government restrictions to access safe and uh, moral methods of euthanasia. That's the stance that we took and um, and those workshops we ran. And so that's the kind of stuff which we do outside of political advocacy as well. Now let's um, just just on the topic of um, on censorship. 
Uh, Patrick, did you want to add into add in anything there, possibly from a uh, legal perspective? Well, uh, I wanted to, to jump onto the topic that, that you um, described of, of what they tried to do uh, 10 years ago in Australia, because they tried to do the same in Germany and uh, after massive protests, which really uh, made the, the German Pirate Party grow strong, they actually abolished this uh, legislation. And we, we used to protest against it by saying, um, uh, taking down instead of uh, blocking, uh, because um, if the content is only blocked, then it's just too easy to circumvent and um, everybody understood that in the end. However, there is now a new push for legislation. That's not about blocking, but it's actually about um, what, what I call incrimination machines. So um, what they want um, um, what they want is not only for public, hosted content, for example, hosted on social networks and, and websites, etc., but also for private communications to be screened by those um, error-prone filters for um, alleged uh, child sexual abuse material and um, automatically alert the police if um, these algorithms detect a hit. So that's a huge problem for um, for victims actually who rely on on safe spaces for communications and um, um, uh, these are taken away from them if um, you know they're being monitored all the time by filters but it's also a huge problem for all of us because these filters are so error prone that according to the um, Swiss federal police 90 percent of all police reports are false and you can imagine that if the police investigates you for possession of child pornography wrongfully that even the investigation itself can have major repercussions and basically uh, destroy your life. If neighbors learn about it, if your partner learns about it, if your employer learns about it, it can have terrible consequences. And um, it's so wrong for, for many times for several reasons. First of all, the database they use for, for matching just contains lots of legal material that's not illegal at all um, because it's fed by companies and they use their terms of services to decide what they include or not. Um, but then secondly, they also use the machine learning. And so um, and no algorithm can determine the age of a person, for example. So that means that um, intimate images, uh, even of adults, will end up in the hands of, of some employees of, of international corporations. We don't know where in the world and what they will do with it. Maybe they will, um, they will sell it. Um, and as you may know, uh, young people often uh, do what, what is called sexting. So they, they just send um, um, naked uh, pictures, images of, of each other um, without any adult interference. But actually, um, I know for Germany that 40% of all investigation procedures target minors for, for doing just, just that and, and, and similar things. So this approach is actually criminalizing uh, children and teenagers that it uh, allege, alleges to, to protect. Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, yeah. And all that it does to invade private communications in this way is really for the organized criminals that are producing this material to, to uh, uh, move even more readily to, to their own servers, to their encrypted uh, uh, communications channels, which makes it even more difficult to prosecute. And this is so short-sighted. But still, uh, in the European Parliament, we, we stand no chance to fight against it. Um, there is only two groups that oppose it, including our own. And um, there is another group that uh, <laughs> basically says, you are right, but because of public pressure, we need to go along. And so the only thing we can do is actually sue in court about this, because the courts have decided in the past that, of course, you cannot use methods of mass surveillance. You cannot indiscriminately um, analyze the content of private communications in search of um, terrorism, it was at that point of time. But obviously the same goes for um, any other illegal material. Uh, and it's so sad that it's the courts in the end that have to take these unpopular decisions because uh, politicians uh, uh, do not um, have the guts to explain to their voters, um, look, the aim is just so important and legitimate, but the method is just so wrong. We need to, we need to use other means. And there is so much that, that would need to be done in terms of, of staffing, in terms of support, in terms of um, police resources. 
Um, all of this is pushed away by a debate that, that pretends, a solutionist debate that pretends that technology can solve the problem. Yeah, and, and over here in Australia, it's been a major talking point for conservative politicians as well to try and crack down on terrorism and protect us against terrorists and terrorist content online and online radicalism and, and all those big scary words. But in the end, it just becomes a campaign promotional material and ends up being directed against uh, often sometimes entirely harmless targets, like in the case of um, uh, child abuse material with sexting, where it's fully consensual and in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases, completely private between the participants, suddenly becomes a, uh, a, a matter which could potentially land them on a sex offender registry, which is which can ruin their life utterly. And we have a huge issue with uh, juvenile incarceration here in Australia and in Queensland particularly, um, a shocking thing which just came to light just a, a couple of years ago and blew up, particularly in the context of um, Indigenous incarceration. And one of those areas where all this attempt to crack down on terrorists can blow off into completely sideline issues came up in a very related topic. So here in, here in Queensland, in Brisbane, we actually hosted the Commonwealth Games a few years ago, which for um, those of you who don't know is uh, for all uh, former British colonies. It's um, essentially a smaller version of the Olympic Games, travels around the um, Commonwealth countries, Canada, um, uh, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, so on. And uh, we hosted here in Brisbane a few years ago, the, <laughs> the Queensland police decided in their wisdom to roll out facial recognition technology onto all of our public transport and um, at the CBD and all of the venues and so on and so forth. Uh, two years ago, a, a report, well, several years ago, a report was conducted after the Commonwealth Games into how effective the biometric, the facial recognition software was. This was kept private. It was buried until the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, did a right to know request, a right to information request, which released the report and found that it was useless. Facial recognition was useless, that uh, none of the targets they'd listed that, hey, these are potential, I don't know, I don't know, they might have called them terrorists. The, the re facial recognition software couldn't find any of them, any of these 16 people. And so the Queensland Police expanded to use it for general policing, of course, and and uh, the, the ACLU here came out against it, and multiple uh, uh, lawyer um, industry bodies, legal industry bodies, came out against it, and we came out against it, and so many other groups, even though it was utterly useless. But you know what it did get used for? There, there was a big protest against the Commonwealth Games at the time, and some of you here in Australia might be familiar, but many of you overseas wouldn't be, because it's a very, again, a very uniquely Australian topic. Uh, the protest called the Stolen Wealth Games, the uh, huge amount of Indigenous activism in Australia centred around the idea of sovereignty, that Australia is a stolen nation uh, from land that was stolen from the Indigenous peoples. They came out to protest the Commonwealth Games as a tie to our colonial past. And, and so there was hundreds, possibly thousands of these, these protesters out there um, campaigning and camping out and blockading many of the venues at, um, at the Gold Coast, the, the sporting venues. And so the police response was massive. The, the police had um, uh, teams out in riot gear, dozens of them uh, monitoring these protests. They had uh, fully armed riot response teams with assault rifles and body armor in armored cars out patrolling Brisbane to look out for these protesters, which is utterly disproportionate. And, and obviously they brought in facial recognition as well. And that was a complete failure. And so that's just yet another example of how these technologies are brought in for one thing, then end up being used for something else because the indigenous protests were, um, were fully justified and, and for the most part fairly peaceful and there were legitimate issues there and they obviously have a right to free speech and a right to protest, but instead the Queensland police used these powers given to them by the government to try and crack down on them. Now, um, uh, and, and it all started from this, this drumbeat about terrorist content online and, and how to deal with it. So um, let's uh, let, let's jump onto a slightly different topic. Uh, Sorry, Miles. Just very briefly, I, I need mm. to leave because I'm speaking at a privacy conference on tracing apps. So so I'll leave you here. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you so much for coming on, Patrick. Uh, thank you for joining us. And um, we'll any more questions we get, we'll I'd be I'd I'd like to forward them onto your office, and hopefully we'll see you again in the future. See you. Thanks so much. Now. Let's let's move on to another issue, which um, 
which has come up and again has parallels in the EU. We've got um, uh, something called the Assistance and Access Bill here in Australia, which was one of the uh, one of the key goals of this legislation was to try and kill encryption. And uh, and so without going into the specifics of it too much, it, it essentially gave legal powers to alphabet agencies, ASIO, whatever, to uh, to compel companies to introduce backdoors into their software. And uh, and so not only is there privacy issues here, but also obviously it's an encryption killer. And so we had tech companies coming out everywhere saying that, well, look, this is going to kill the Australian tech industry because we're no longer going to be trusted anywhere in the world when all, all everywhere around the world, everyone's going to know the Australian tech companies all have backdoors by law required to have backdoors, which can be abused by not only law enforcement and government, but also by any illicit actor, uh, bad hackers, hostile state actors, can also use these backdoors should they find them. And I know that in the EU, there's also been similar legislative push from certain bodies to try and weaken encryption. Uh, Marcel, did you have any thoughts on this? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> The, the, this when I when I talked about um, you know how uh, politicians often don't understand how the internet works um, yeah they don't often understand how uh, the technology works because we've been seeing this push uh, to weaken encryption uh, to introduce backdoors etc and we're usually given some legitimately looking reasoning behind that like um the already mentioned um uh, the already mentioned um uh, so, sorry for the doorbell here if if you uh, if you can hear it um <laughs> um so so uh, the already mentioned uh, child sexual abuse material or terrorist content or anything like that the issue is uh that encryption is of course uh, used uh, for you know things like securing your data, uh, securing your connection to your uh, to, to to your bank, etc. But but also for uh, you know the national security. So uh, so uh, you know uh, weakening encryption means you know endangering the security of all of us. Now. Um, the the problem is that there still is this uh, idea in in the back of the minds of some politicians that we still could find some middle ground, and some and find a way how we could weaken encryption for the illegitimate uses and um, and 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 have it have it you know strong for the legitimate uses. Of course, if you know how technology works, you know this is nonsense because this is mathematics, and you cannot. You cannot ignore uh, mathematics. That's basically, you know, uh, that, that's basically the law that that rules, um, uh, kind of like naturally. If you are or you are not able to do something uh, because it's mathematically difficult uh, or mathematically easy to do something, then it's just like that, and you can hardly fight that with a with the with the legislation. Um, uh, uh, the 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 problem is that if you don't respect that then you will get into a, a very uh, you know d weird uh, vicious circle into trying to find a solution while of course those who use it for for non legitimate reasons let's say like criminals they will always find ways how to escape from that i think of different you know peer-to-peer, end-to-end encrypted uh, communication systems that you just you, you, you just cannot tackle it on, on, on the technical level. They will always be able to do this. So this will, would only open us uh, uh, towards you know, dangers, but, but it would not solve any issue whatsoever. Uh, that's the problem. We had, um, uh, the, the pirates had fought, uh, and, and we have been fighting all these initiatives that are coming from different uh, EU bodies, and we'll continue doing that because it's just pure nonsense. 
if I may add a few words on the uh, on the top of that, uh, should you have the opportunity yeah, yes. to talk uh, to someone from like Australian government who is willing to introduce that, please tell them that it's a really stupid idea because it can cost Australia a shit lot of money. Uh, I mean, like uh, so far we are currently discussing in the European Parliament something which is called the digital operan uh, operational resilience. Uh, uh, the idea is that effectively. Uh, that uh, we uh, want to protect our financial sector from uh, cyber attacks. So uh, we are setting standards for uh, how to report cyber attacks, how to prevent, uh, how to, how to uh, secure the infrastructure and stuff like that. And one very uh, important issue that comes there is the question of uh, third country uh, providers uh, of uh, security security stuff. I mean, like uh, when you are, uh, we would we would definitely not like to build a wall around Europe and say, hey, if you are from uh, uh, the other countries, like from Austria or any other country, you can't go and deliver us uh, software which will be used in our financial sector. However, there will be definitely uh, some restrictions in the sense of like, there should not be backdoors in the software you are delivering for like security purposes. So should you uh, mandatorily introduce backdoors to the software you are delivering, we cannot like buy it from you, which means like, it's of course uh, quite like a sovereign decision of Australian government, but you have uh, you are now discussing whether you want to exclude yourself from a market with, let's say, a half a billion of consumers, which is not really a smart idea from the business point of view, I would say, but it's definitely your business decision, not ours. Yeah, but I would not do that in being you. Look, look, tech companies in Australia said the same thing. They said, look, we're going to become the laughing stock of the world and no one's going to want to do business with us. And, you know, here we are now. So <laughs> what can we do? But, but our current prime minister, uh, sorry, our previous uh, two prime ministers ago, a conservative by the name of um, Tony Abbott, lovely guy, real beauty, wants to bring back the monarchy to Australia. Uh, legitimately, he wants to bring back the monarchy. He um, he said once when when confronted about how the laws of mathematics mean that this um, you've weakened the encryption, so the laws of mathematics mean that it'll be very easy to break now. And this man, pr former prime minister Tony Abbott, I shit you not, he was quoted as saying. The laws of mathematics don't apply in Australia. Only Australian laws do, and that's the <laughs> caliber. That's the caliber of, of conservative prime ministers we have. Uh, uh, yeah, people who heard that, like, we just want to go and jump out a window next. Well, after hearing stuff like that, you're like, can anyone legitimately like? Did this man go to school? Did this man complete high school? And now he's trying to run our government. Uh, He's, he's as someone pointed out in chat he's famous for being able to eat an entire onion raw and trying to shirt front um uh putin the man who wrestled a bear naked and trained with the spetsnaz in siberia <laughs> ridiculous absolutely ridiculous so yeah, i remember this quote I, re I i remember this quote is really famous that only the laws of australia apply in australia and all the laws of mathematics and well that's you know, one of the examples um, of why I said that we need more politicians that, that understand how technology works. Or even, you know, how, how maths works. I'd, I'd settle for a prime minister who understands how numbers work. <laughs> so uh, but, well, let's, be, let's, let's be honest, technology is nothing else than applied mathematics, uh, physics mm. and chemistry, basically. Mm, mm, absolutely. Yeah. So, so on a related topic, while we're talking about um, uh, software and te internet technology, um, Mikolash, you you campaigned recently about bringing in open source software to the European Union. Do you want to talk about that for a little bit? Yeah, for sure. Uh, for sure. Um, I mean, like, we have a general problem with digitization of uh, public administration everywhere in the world. I mean, like, Usually it works that way, the public servants, they are not really able to design the, the IT systems. So uh, more or less what happens there, they are uh, uh, like the, uh, all the, all the uh, procurements, they are kind of like being uh, overpriced. 
just like the agreements, uh, they are uh, they are uh, written in very poor way. I mean, like I have seen a system uh, in Czech Republic which served to uh, for the purpose of uh, like keeping information about like uh, welfare benefits, like uh, unemployment subsidies and stuff like that, of uh, about like the whole population. I mean, like. They were able to or, uh, order this piece of software from a company which delivered it as a service. So they have absolutely no control over the code, no control over the data. They just were uh, relying on a particular company who could anytime switch it off and effectively cut the whole nation from uh, the, the unemployment subsidies, uh, pensions, and so on. So that's what uh, what uh, happened there, and it was a result of uh, public servants were unable to really introduce a good uh, good uh, uh, contract to uh, to order software for for the public administration. So my idea, and that's something I'm for, is that anytime a public administration is ordering uh, ordering uh, any software for for their purpose, it should be open source. I mean, like. A public administration shall have the access to the code and uh, should be able to kind of like uh, reuse it in the case that the particular provider will no longer be provided. That's, uh, I think, an essential tool to uh, avoid, uh, to avoid uh, those, those vendor lock-ins. And uh, when we come to the, to the question of price, I believe there are a lot of like uh, open source alternatives to, to the proprietary softwares that are uh, so software that is being used in uh, all uh, of human uh, human uh, uh, activity, which means like uh, we have very much uh, opportunity to choose from and uh, reuse that, and I think we should we should use that. I, I mean, like we we uh, tackled the issue from a little bit. Uh, a different direction than, than one would expect. I'm a member of budgetary control committee, which means like I started asking uh, in the European institutions, like, hey, do you use open software to uh, open source to kind of like reduce the costs you have for uh, for IT? And uh, yeah, that was kind of like uh, successful because like uh, some of the institutions started reporting us, yes, we already do in some cases, we try to improve. Some were uh, more reluctant, some some less. But at, uh, at the end, like we are we are moving, uh, we are progressing, and uh, really like uh, it it succeeded. I mean, like uh, usually when you uh, talk about open software or free software, the conservative politicians they are kind of like reluctant to to support you because like when they say something, uh, when they hear free, they are already triggered, and uh, that that's, it sounds too liberal for them. However, when you talk about budgetary uh, budgetary control and financial responsibility, and this is actually a way to save money, they kind of like understand, and from time to time you can manage to, to convince them to support you. So, which, which kind of like uh, succeeded, and like uh, we started in in the uh, annual reports uh, uh, for the uh, during the last year, and this year we uh, really see uh, like an improvement overall in these institutions that, that what they are what they are reporting. So, I'm really happy about that, and. We will definitely push for for that. It's a little bit maybe invisible uh, for uh, on the first side, but uh, I think we are really like changing it from from in within, and that's that's very useful. I, I would very much recommend that, and uh, you can do it uh, as well if you are like uh, running, uh, I don't know, like municipal administration or like any single small town uh, anywhere in the world can start with doing that and uh, using open source in order to save costs and. Uh, ensure security for for the local administration. Yeah, yeah if I may add a bit to, to that, I think the bottom line uh, is is the the public money public code principle. Uh, it, it's it's absolutely uh, normal in in any other area that you know something that you you know pay tax mayor uh, you, you use taxpayers money. At, to pay for something, then the result also, you know, uh, needs to be uh, public. And it, it's very difficult to understand why this principle does not work uh, with, with with software. And it, it's 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 a major issue 
uh, that is bringing this vendor lock in um, problems were uh, where the administration buys something um, um, for for public money completely completely funds the development of it but still they have no uh, copyright over the result I mean that is something that is absolutely uh, unacceptable for us because then if we use the taxpayers money to buy this then also the result needs to be uh, uh, re reusable uh, in 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 the public yeah so yeah Mikolash, you're right this is awesome but it does tend to be a bit invisible it's something that isn't it's not really it's not really a sexy policy it's not something which people really know or understand or grasp unless you know software you know open source you know free software and you understand the benefits already like um uh like you said talk from a budgetary perspective and the offline politicians just get on side immediately i'm a huge supporter of open source um and by extension free software as in free beer i've got um i think i've got something like nearly two and a half million lines of code on across various accounts on open source github projects uh, over various years and and so it's something which it, it's absolutely this really obscure niche issue which you don't understand until you get into it and you understand well look open source projects have done these incredible things so many commercial pri proprietary systems are based off open source like um the, the unix kernel is uh, is is the basis for modern operating systems and that was all free and open source and it's still to this day maintained as a free open source operating system via uh, via successor linux so this is stuff which is um which there are so many clear benefits around transparency and democratization which sometimes do tend to get a bit lost in the technical specifics so while we're on the topic of um uh marcel you brought up copyright so coming back coming back to that topic we um you've been campaigning recently on on something very interesting which has actually popped up once or twice on our radar here in here in the australian pirates which is to do with artificial intelligence. Now, the um, I, I remember a few years ago, there was an algorithm which actually uh, someone wrote, I can't remember where in the world it was, but this was a few years ago. They wrote an algorithm to automatically generate every single possible melody. And they generated like 10 million or a billion different melodies using this algorithm and then released all of those melodies under an open source license or a creative commons license in the hopes that all music forever afterwards would now be free and open source and, and creative commons so uh, M marcel what have you been doing in that space that you're saying that because i had the idea a couple of years ago uh <laughs> oh, that, 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 that oh i'm sorry <laughs> No, 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 no. I, I don't think I have ever published that uh, anywhere. But I had this idea a couple of years ago that we could do something like this. But, but I'm afraid that you know, um, also law does not uh, often work in a way that we would, you know, naturally uh, think, as in common sense, um, and and has a lot of uh, pitfalls. So, so I'm not sure about you know, from a legal perspective, this is what would what would really happen. Um, but, uh, you, you know, when, when you connect AI and, and copyright, uh, what, what I, um, have been, you know, promoting is, um, that, uh, we cannot allow to create another layer of, of copyright, um, that, that would be attributed to artificial intelligence or whoever, uh, you know, owns the, uh, the the artificial intelligence or or, or which or a framework you know uh, comes to mind because that that would be a major problem for for future uh, creativity. Um, but when it comes to AI in general, uh, there we already touched upon the the mass surveillance by facial recognition, but there are also other uh you know uh I issues that are connected to that so on one hand artificial intelligence and machine learning i think all of us agree um also you know as people who um uh, who are keen you know on you know new modern technologies that it, it is a huge opportunity 
for the future and, and it can help us uh, a lot uh, with a, a, a lot of in a lot of fields you know health think of healthcare uh, think think of you know anywhere uh, self driving cars etc but also uh, it, it's it, it, we cannot let just uh, you know anybody do anything with artificial intelligence and we need strict regulation and the idea that um, you know i have is that we need several la- levels of risk depending on how the artificial artificial intelligence would be used and according to it there would be a regulation uh depending on on which risk level we basically are one of the areas that i focused on in 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 one of the reports of the european parliament was the use by uh, the police and, and judicial authorities, and and I insisted that you know this would be an area with a very high risk, uh, because as you can imagine, uh, you you cannot really allow algorithms uh, fed with some data uh, to decide on whether you know someone is guilty or not, for instance. So, so take it to an extreme, but there are also other issues connected with that. For instance, if police used uh, artificial intelligence in order to uh, identify where more police officers are needed because there's more criminality, then of course you are basically feeding it with, with biased data uh, because because uh, you, you have data on, for instance, in, in some city area there is more criminality you put more officers there and with that you are making the data biased even more because uh, of course uh, there is the dependence on how many officers you have and how much criminality you are able to to reveal so you would have literally areas with no police officers because there is no criminality there um quote unquote uh, and you would have areas that are, you know, where you, you would have police officers heavily deployed because there is a lot of criminality apparently because every single thing that happens is 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 uh, discovered immediately. So there are a lot of these, you know, issues and discrimination and bias is one of the major problems of artificial intelligence uh, in a lot of areas and, and we need to really be careful there and have a legislation that will that will you know allow us to 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 strictly regulate that where we need and of course uh you know s- having spoken about um open source just a while ago i also need to stress that open source and open data are best fit in order to you know build artificial intelligence that is transparent and 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 and, and is human centered and really works for the humankind yeah and when we talk about surveillance here in Australia, uh, and automated surveillance and biometric facial recognition, so on and so, so forth, that's something which comes up again and again. The the issue of discrimination and the um, and the related issue about uh, allocation of policing resources, because we do have an issue here in Australia where Indigenous communities are over policed, and and there is bias, not so much quotas here as there are have been in America. But there's definitely a lot of bias in. Uh, we've seen uh, evidence of bias in some p- state police forces towards over policing I- indigenous areas, um, indigenous communities, or indigenous youth. And and so you know they kind of run hand in hand when the police already has this bias towards one particular area, and then they bring in um, automated security to deal with it. Well, obviously they're going to focus it on those same areas already. And so it compounds a problem in a, in a way which is, you know, didn't need to get worse. It's already bad enough as it is. So on a, um, on, on a completely different topic, I um, actually, no, sorry, related to AI. And I, I just wanted to say that AI is, um, is a little, is a huge interest area of mine, actually, uh, almost a more of a professional interest area, more in the context of games as, um, uh, professionally, I, I actually work in in the game space, and so um, AI has always fascinated me. There, design of AI for games. Now, we've got a question in chat from uh, Will of the Young Pirates of Norway. He's asking, "What what is the uh, Pirate Party Czechia and the European Pirates doing about uh, the games industry in Europe?" Very very quickly now. Open question. Uh, 
if I may, uh, I think it is part of, let's say, the broader uh, broader question of like the digital market, and we need to first of all ensure its integrity. I mean, like uh, I, I know there were uh, in few, uh, last uh, last week's discussions about like whether it is legitimate to sell a game in within one of the countries and then block it in the others because of selling for for different uh, price over there. I mean, like. Um, uh, the, 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 uh, this, this this is a form of job blocking that should be that should be abolished, and because we really need to ensure uh, the, uh, we really need to enter the digital single market. I'm really here uh, speaking from from my perspective. I spent like those uh, few years in Germany, and it was exactly that way. That from Monday to Friday uh, I was in Germany, and uh, weekends I spent in Czechia. And I, I was still, I was traveling like 200 kilometers. Uh, I was definitely not really like interested in uh, uh, that when I play a game, uh, I will not be able to continue in the safe game for uh, over weekend just because I moved across the border. I want my my licenses, I want uh, everything like that to be available uh, everywhere in Europe. That's something that should be assured and uh, we should say for geoblocking is definitely one thing. Something. Yeah, if I may add to it, uh, there, there was a geo-blocking legislation in the in the previous mandate that really went south on all these, you know, digital things. So, so basically, uh, while tackling some other issues, basically the, the the most important ones was not tackled, and also, you know, uh, it, it's it's completely clear that the major blocker here is that we don't have a unitary copyright. So we definitely need a unitary copyright in um, uh, in Europe. We we need a you know true copyright reform, not not what we have seen in, in the in the previous mandate uh, with introducing a lot of new restrictions, but not really you know tackling the the major issue of fragmenting the market. And um, I've been you know fighting in my uh, uh, in the committee where I'm a member of uh, the the internal market committee to to bring this uh, geo blocking issue issue back uh, because there definitely is a gap that we need to address. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. And um, we might uh, we might wrap up there. So this has been uh, Pirate Live with three members of the European Parliament. Uh, Patrick Breyer from Germany, as well as Marcel Kolaya and Mikolaj Pekša uh, Pe from Czechia. Uh, thank you so much, gentlemen, for coming on at the uh, ungodly hour of 7.30 a.m. in the morning or, or, or 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock, whatever it was we hopped on. So uh, do you have any final words for the um, Australian pirate movement? Yeah, I'd like to encourage everyone, um, you know, uh, to continue what they have been doing because um, that that's of a great importance. Uh, I remember, you know, back in the days where uh, we were uh, almost invisible as a political party, and now we are polling at uh, twenty percent uh, in the Czech Republic, and 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 we are basically. Um, uh, we we have the chances with the elections, you know, coming this fall, uh, to have the first um, uh, pirate uh, prime minister uh, in in the world. Uh, so I mean, uh, if you if you do the right things, if you do the things right way, then then um, you, you never know when it kind of like breaks and 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 you, uh, you you will go through a major success. So I keep my Fingers crossed. And of course, uh, thanks for having us. Uh, it, it was a pleasure. Um, uh, also, it's it's not that bad, actually, because it's half past 10 at this moment. So so it's it, it's it's OK. I remember when I was a co-president uh, of the Pirate Parties International um, uh, many years ago, uh, I attended virtually the uh, General Assembly of the Pirate Party of New Zealand, and it was some like 3 a.m. Uh, for me, so that was a lot worse. <laughs> I would also like to thank you all uh, for the invitation. The discussion was uh, very interesting for me, and I'm really keeping fingers crossed for your for your Senate election and uh, for the part of the election. I believe like uh, it's definitely possible there are Czech pirates, German pirates uh, in the parliament, but uh, what was not mentioned here, 
uh, Luxembourgish pirates native to the parliament, Icelandic pirates native to, uh, pirates native to the parliament. So it's definitely pos possible. It's uh, it's it takes a lot of effort, but you can definitely make it as well as uh, as the others. I'm I'm really looking forward to see Pirate Party of Australia to uh, to form Australian government. I, I think I, that would be incredible. So I'm keeping fingers crossed, and I hope it will it will happen so, uh, rather soon than later. Well, the first step is getting a uh, Australian pirate elected, and then a second Australian pirate, and then the third. It's just dominoes, and they all go from there. So thank you so much, Marcel and Mikolaj, and uh, we'll hear from you soon. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.